Welcome everyone. We are live and starting our event. I'm so happy to see so many people with us tonight for this event. Um, I'm just going to give it a moment as we let everyone into the webinar. And we are thrilled that you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to this evening's virtual event with John Reed. My name is Carell Centers and I'm the events director here at Bookshop Santa Cruz where I'm broadcasting live. And tonight we are thrilled to celebrate the release of Evergreen, Saving Big Forests to Save the Planet. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Humanities Institute at UCSC. And I hope many of you um, heard about the event through THI. I'm gonna pop a link into the chat a little bit later so you can check out their programming as well if you are not familiar with the Humanities Institute. They've got some really good stuff coming up. So I hope you check it out. Tonight we'll have a presentation about Evergreen and then John will answer some of your questions. But before we get started, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of the platform we're using here tonight, which is Zoom webinar. This is a webinar, so we can't see you or hear you at home. But we are here together and I welcome you to drop a line in the chat if you feel so inclined. You can let us know where you're tuning in from, um, if you've bought the book yet, um, and anything you'd like to share with us here, please just keep it respectful. And if you'd like everyone to see your messages, just make sure that it's toggled on to everyone. You can also just sit back and let that roll on without you, no worries. Closed captioning is automatically on and you can hide that if you'd like. Um, and this event is also being recorded so that you can rewatch it if you miss anything or you can share it with friends. We'll send that link out tomorrow about 24 hours after the event has concluded. We'll also be uploading it to our YouTube page later tonight if you can't wait for tomorrow. And again, I'll put that link in the chat. We will, as I mentioned, be having an audience Q&A. That Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's a little tab that you can click and pop your question in anytime as the talk is underway. Please do um, ask any questions you have about megaforests, climate change. We have an expert on our hands, so we would love to um, have some questions later this evening. We also have um, the book available for purchase. Your purchase supports local jobs and independent culture, and it shows the publisher that our audience is invested and engaged here in Santa Cruz. So thank you so much for your purchase. Links will be coming in the chat as soon as I wrap up this intro, so you can click there to buy your copy of the book. We do have a lot of great events coming up. We have our first in-person, in-store event since the pandemic. Um, that'll be tomorrow uh, with Kara Black here at the store. We also have some fun nonfiction stuff coming up, a free virtual event with Felicia Kokotsin Ruiz for her book, Earth Medicines, Ancestral Wisdom, Healing Recipes and Wellness Rituals. That's gonna be on April 14th at 6 p.m., free virtual event. And we have a free in-person event here in the store um, in May, May 11th, with Shonda Prescott Weinstein for The Disordered Cosmos, a journey into dark matter, space time, and dreams deferred. So definitely hope to see you back for either of those or any other event that we have coming up. We love to have our audience um, so invested in our events program. So thank you so much. But now on to the main attraction. John Reed founded Conservation Strategy Fund winner of the 2012 MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. He is now the senior economist for Nia Taro, which supports indigenous guardianship of vital ecosystems. John's work has appeared in the New York Times, Scientific American, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, and The Atlantic, among other outlets. And John lives in Sebastopol, California, where he joins us from tonight. So please join me in welcoming John Reed. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much, Carell. It's great to be here. Uh, and thank you to Bookshop Santa Cruz for welcoming Evergreen into the world on our publication day. It's really cool to see all those books around you. Oh um, and I encourage everybody to buy your copy from Bookshop Santa Cruz uh, so that all of Carell's copies are gone tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I really do appreciate. And it's great, all of you who are um, tuning in here in this virtual space, to hear about the book and the, the forest that we're writing about. Uh, so here's the, here's the program for, for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna do a short reading to begin with, uh, and then I'm gonna roll a slideshow uh, and show you some of the places that 
uh, my co-author and I, Tom Lovejoy, uh, write about. Uh, and then hopefully by the bottom of the hour, we'll be breaking uh, from that for your questions. So I hope you do have questions and we can have a discussion here over the course of this hour. So um, I'll get started with a reading from my copy. Um, and where we're gonna start is in the beginning. Uh, I'll be reading from the, the prologue, <clears throat> which is called Anastasia's Woods. Birds of paradise and crossed hatchets decorate her yellow party dress. Bare feet pick a path over roots and rocks and quilts of moist leaves. Little brown hands grip ferns for balance as she lowers herself down a slope so steep you can reach sideways and touch the earth. She weaves through gaps in shoulder-high limestone, ancient corals that were compressed until they had nowhere to go but up and into a new career as mountains. The girl's feet seem scarcely to feel the brittle edges. She turns her close-cropped head and gives us a smile, then disappears down the path. Anastasia is a two-year-old member of the Momo clan, which for generations beyond reckoning has lived in this forest in Western New Guinea. She is accompanied by her mother, Sopiana Yesnap, a family friend named Mariana Hai, and Anastasia's aunt, Finche Momo, who is shadowed by a limping pointy-eared hunting dog named Hunter. Several visitors scramble to keep up. The way leads into leafy gullies and along a toothy forested ridge. After three hours, we arrive at a flat spot just big enough for our tents and a fire. Nearby, a clear stream flows over a bed of limestone bulbs formed by the calcium carbonate of ancient shells and exoskeletons that dissolved farther up the mountain. So with that, I am gonna share my screen and take you to Brazil. Um, are we seeing this? We're seeing it, okay. lightning, trees, and a river. Yeah. So Evergreen is um, uh, a distillation of the careers uh, that uh, Tom Lovejoy and I have spent in conservation. Uh, and if there was a, an, an aha moment when I knew that I was gonna be involved in writing a book, it was probably uh, in this spot on the Rio Negro in Brazil uh, sitting on a granite dome that uh, projects up above the forest canopy and looking in all directions uh, and seeing forest all the way to the horizon. And seeing this forest in every direction, no matter which way I looked, uh, that was all under the effective stewardship uh, of indigenous tribes. Uh, and I came away feeling like we hear too much bad stuff about the forest. Uh, and I think a cre uh, an impression has created a narrative that it's all on fire, it's too late, uh, and we should maybe think about other priorities. Uh, but those of us who have had the privilege, uh, and it is a privilege to be in places like this, know that the reality is different uh, and that there still are great forests uh, on our planet. And it's a good thing too, because uh, these great forests have all of their biological parts uh, interacting, evolving, and metabolizing uh, carbon uh, into life in ways that are crucial for us to continue to, to be able to thrive and live uh, on the planet. And so uh, on the one hand, I wanted to bring some good news back uh, it, that both the forest is still there and there are people who have figured out how to take care of it. Also, um, this was a time when I was really questioning, so, so how, do we, how do we win? How do we be effective? Uh, how do we really translate the full meaning and value of these big ecosystems to policymakers and to ordinary people so that uh, the, their importance sinks in to the people who wield levers of power and people who decide how to, um, how to live and how to dedicate their own activist energy uh, to different causes. So um, 
my path sort of started there and it took me to the door of um, Tom Lovejoy, uh, who was really the first biologist to do large scale experiments on the effects of forest fragmentation in the Amazon. And for many years had been uh, saying to anybody who would listen that we can't just think about forests uh, on a local scale, although that's incredibly important, we had to think about them on large scales, even continental scales, because they were functioning as huge biological physical systems uh, that were crucial to the, the functioning of our planet. So Tom and I got together and began doing some writing in 2018 that eventually evolved into a book. And we decided to focus the book on the five biggest forests in the world. Um, finding them wasn't hard because there had been some great science done in the early 2000s, thanks to the evolution of satellite imagery and computing power, uh, as well as on the ground mapping. Uh, and that science had identified that the places that were still a continental uh, in scale with intact cores, uh, a forest uninterrupted by roads and industry and the things that caused them to break down. Uh, were two boreal forests, uh, which means forests in cold northern places, uh, and three tropical forests. The boreal forests, uh, the North American uh, megaforest, as we call it, it starts at, on the western end in Alaska, uh, covers much of central Alaska, dips down the Pacific coast of Alaska and British Columbia in a sort of a temperate fringe, and then uh, extends all the way across Canada to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, it used to be part of one massive circumpolar uh, forest that uh, include, included at that time the, the Russian taiga uh, before the, the Bering Land Bridge uh, was inundated. Uh, so there are a lot of species uh, of plants and animals that are uh, in common between these two ecosystems. Uh, the taiga is the biggest forest uh, in the world. And going down to the tropics, uh, you have, of course, the Amazon. And, and when we quiz our friends and neighbors and family about what are the five biggest forests in the world, that was the one that people could pretty consistently get. Uh, the other five, uh, the other four were, were touch and go. Uh, the second largest tropical forest is the Congo and New Guinea, uh, which is the second largest island in the world. Uh, is completely covered uh, in trees. So we're going to go first to New Guinea and meet the young lady who uh, I described in the in the prologue, Anastasia Momo, who shares this mountain forest with beings like this one. Uh, this is a paradise kingfisher uh, that's uh, hiding out in a thicket uh, on the Momo territory. Her aunt, uh, Finche Momo, is in this image. And it was just amazing walking around the forest with her. Because uh, as we went, she was just pointing out uh, plants that you could pretty much cover the whole array of things people need uh, from the plants that were immediately around uh, her in the forest. So whether it was something to eat or something to cure uh, an illness with or something to make dogs better at hunting, uh, the, it was all there. Um, and she would also tell us history. So what, what to a, a, a first time visitor uh, just looks like a, a uniform um, blanket of trees um, had history and had functions that were specific. So this area in this image uh, is where the Momos used to grow all their food <clears throat> until the uh, 1990s, more or less. Um, and then they moved their garden somewhere else. And they had moved their gardens here from somewhere else. And this rotation throughout the territory had gone on over generations uh, beyond counting. Uh, the people, the, the, the native peoples of New Guinea have been on the island um, going back over 50,000 years. Um, so these cycles and, and the existence of the forest uh, with people goes back that far. Um, now this image here, uh, I couldn't pass up sharing with you all. Um, and uh, for two reasons, 
Uh, and two things that New Guinea is really known for. One is its birds of paradise. Uh, this is a king bird of paradise. And New Guinea has 39 of the 42 species of birds of paradise that exist uh, on earth. Um, and believe it or not, birds of paradise are relatives of crows, but um, none of them are, are <laughs> they all have these fantastic uh, colors and, and behaviors uh, that we don't associate with crows. Um, the, the second reason I wanted to show you this slide is the, the guy in the picture is a guy named Derek who was walking around uh, the forest with me at night. And he's from a tribe called the Abun tribe. And the Abun tribe speaks a language that is unrelated to any other language on earth. Uh, you may know that Basque uh, is also what's called an, a linguistic isolate, uh, which can't be traced to any common linguistic ancestry with uh, any other uh, existing language. Um, New Guinea, uh, a language is isolates are remarkable uh, in that not even the people who live right around uh, Derek's tribe speak a related language. And the whole island has over a thousand languages, which makes it the linguistic diversity uh, epicenter uh, of our planet. Um, that linguistic diversity encodes generations, hundreds of generations uh, of knowledge about the forest, way of talking about the forest, ways of seeing the world, uh, ways of solving problems. And so one of the things that we really emphasize in the book is that it's not just about um, biodiversity and it's not just about climate change, but it's about humanity's ability to think. Uh, and every forest we lose and every culture we lose with it, we narrow uh, that ability to think. Okay, we're gonna go next to the Congo. Uh, the Congo is known for its big trees and big animals. Uh, this silverback western lowland gorilla is, <coughs> excuse me, sitting and snacking in front of a, a huge uh, Dubosia macrocarpa tree, which produces these uh, hard octagonal fruits uh, that are um, a favorite food, both of the gorillas and the forest elephants uh, that live in this forest. Uh, this shot here is uh, showing another big tree, but I put this one in because it's a, um, it's a strangler fig. And uh, the way the strangler fig makes a living is it starts out as a seedling high in the branches of another tree, sends down roots to the ground. The roots harden into a trunk that encases the host tree, and eventually the host tree uh, dies and um, leaves this uh, majestic hollow uh, trunk. But in the, the reason I put it in here is because the, the canopy of this tree when the picture was taken is full of gorillas and, and chimpanzees feeding together. This is a, a rare site that wasn't known to occur uh, a couple of decades ago and is possible in this place because of the level of protection that it has uh, as a national park. The, the formula that's working there is the formal protection, uh, a very active uh, program of recruitment of local guards um, and research. So there's an active research program uh, on the primates. And one of the, the outstanding researchers there is a botanist uh, who's standing next to me named David Coney, who could identify <clears throat> or um, at least he said he could, and I believed him, any plant in the forest uh, with his eyes closed just by touching it. Um, and he identified this um, one of 18 species of native ginger in the forest that he told me I needed to, to curl up and, and stick in my ears to keep the, the sweat bees off of me, um, which worked uh, medium well. Uh, the uh, the original people of this forest in the Congo uh, have been there for something between 30 and 60,000 years. Uh, so a reasonable fraction of the time that humans, uh, th that Homo sapiens has been a thing. Uh, and what's really remarkable about the peoples that 
uh, throughout the, the Congo Basin uh, are collectively referred to uh, by the term pygmy, uh, but have each one their own uh, distinct uh, real names, uh, is that they're still there. Uh, they've been interacting with migrants from other parts of Africa, from West Africa and Northeastern Africa for three to 4,000 years as farmers from those regions moved into the Congo and live side by side uh, if, with uh, the, the original people. But the, uh, the original people have kept uh, cultural identity, in many cases, language, and in all cases, uh, a role as the sort of the, the, the intermediaries between other human beings in the forest. Uh, it's remarkable to, to go to a forest like the one that I visited in the Western Congo, and people don't go anywhere without pygmy, pygmy uh, guides. Uh, and everybody has a story about unexplainable things that the, the people, the guides are able to do in terms of navigation uh, and knowing what's going on in the forest without seeing it. <clears throat> so um, the one thing I wanted to, to sort of note here is that while the protected areas uh, like the one that we're in in these last few images, uh, it's called Nuabali Ndoki National Park, have been a, a, in a sense, a great success story uh, that we talk about in the book, but the, the area of, of protected land expanding from 4% of the land area uh, of our planet to about 17% uh, today between 1990 and, and, and the present day. Um, Parks have not been without their problems and without not been without their ethical uh, lapses where people have been pushed out uh, to create parks. Uh, their livelihoods uh, that are fully sustainable uh, have been imposed upon. Uh, and this sort of um, heavy handed um, way of creating parks is being reformed. Uh, in where I've worked the most in Brazil, there are a huge number of categories of protected areas with um, nuance to take account of keeping uh, viable forest economies viable and functioning and really the motor of forest conservation uh, rather than imposing a model that doesn't make any sense locally. So moving to the boreal in Canada, a good example of what I'm talking about is a movement to create uh, what are called indigenous uh, protected and conserved areas. In 2018, a circle of Canadian indigenous experts came up with guidelines for bringing in the traditional laws about land use from the various First Nations across the, the Canadian boreal and putting those together with uh, the legal structures that exist in Canadian law uh, to protect land um, and fusing these two. And the first few of these areas have now been created and they're sort of mind blowingly large uh, landscapes of protected forest that have these, these streams of both indigenous uh, and bureaucratic uh, protection mechanisms um, and it, it, to a large extent are being uh, patrolled by indigenous guardians. So these two fellows here, um, um, Clifford McLeod and John Acklack, they, they're in the book uh, and the area that they um, are working on um, protecting is a huge swath of forest in British Columbia and the Yukon. These pictures are from the Yukon uh, where they live, but they have uh, uh, First Nations of their same uh, Casca people who live further south in British Columbia. And altogether, what they're proposing is to protect um, 24 million acres of intact forest. Uh, the, the government of Canada realized that there's no way that they can realize their ambitions of protecting 30% of their landscape by 2030 um, without the full 
cooperation, if not the, the leadership uh, of indigenous communities. So we're gonna go now to the Taiga and another indigenous leader um, who has been fighting to protect his people's territory. So this uh, is a friend of mine named Norbu Lama, and he invited uh, me and uh, my family to visit him in the Sion Mountains in the border region between Russia and Mongolia. Um, his people are called the Sayuts, and they live in this extreme Southern Russia uh, region. Uh, we had some interesting times getting through checkpoints uh, in the, the border region, which is a tightly controlled space. Uh, fortunately, we were there in 2019 and not today. I'm sure it would be a different story. But we had the privilege to, to go there and talk to Norbu Lama and hear about this thing called a territory of traditional nature use that he set up uh, covering the entirety of the, the municipality where he lives. Uh, and the idea of this um, uh, category of land use, which was created, which was pushed and created by indigenous activists uh, around the year 2000, is to get indigenous peoples a place at the table to begin to bring their knowledge and uh, rights to, to manage land according to their traditions uh, back into a system that had been uh, severely, or there, those rights had been severely curtailed uh, in the Soviet times. Um, and not to sugarcoat it, it's, um, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Um, but it's very inspiring for, for me to see people uh, willing to get up and sort of join that battle every day. And I think in part, I mean, Norbu Lama is driven by the fact that uh, this is a, a, a staggering, uh, irreplaceable, still intact landscape of mountains and forests. Um, when we visited in the late spring, the forest was just, it was sort of like, it looked like it had uh, magenta confetti in the, in the understory uh, because all of these Dahurian rhododendrons, which have about quarter sized blossoms uh, were blooming. Um, and the forest is also, um, it's not just a place uh, with um, trees. Uh, it's a place where spirits and ancestors are. Uh, and in various places where you walk around and the spirits are being recognized, um, prayed to the shrine on the left side of this thing is to the Mongolian heroes uh, and ancestors of the people who inhabit this region uh, near Lake Baikal. So uh, last, but not least, we're gonna to go to uh, the Amazon and uh, to uh, a view from above of a giant Samauma tree. These are sacred to many peoples of the Amazon uh, and they're often missing from the landscape where roads uh, and settlements have brought people in big numbers uh, into the forest. Uh, that's because they're big and the timber is useful uh, and the, these trees are, are called emergence because they emerge up above the forest canopy. Um, and the uh, emergent trees in a forest that's been logged are often a missing component of the ecosystem. That's bad news for these guys. Um, this black spider monkey is a female that uh, I got a chance to spend a few minutes with uh, in the Bolivian Amazon. And uh, she relies on uh, big extensions of forest because she feeds from widely spaced trees like the Samauma that we saw in the previous slide. And my co-author, uh, Dr. Lovejoy, uh, one of the early uh, discoveries of his forest fragmentation experiments in the Brazilian Amazon was that the black spider monkeys are one of the first uh, species to fall out of a fragmented ecosystem. The hope that I have, and it, I, I do genuinely have hope, we can discuss hope in the, in the Q&A a little bit if there's an appetite for that, 
but it uh, rests with people like these two guys. Um, the, the man on the left is a friend of mine uh, who his uh, traditional name is Tama, Tama Saimpa. And the man on the right is called Kaisuma. These two are from tribes that neighbor each other and for centuries were blood rivals uh, involved in all kinds of violence and kidnapping and warfare up through the 1980s. Uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, they realized that they had common enemies and, and common cause and a purpose in consolidating the protection of a huge indigenous territory where they live along with four other tribes and with a dozen groups of uncontacted indigenous peoples. So together uh, in 2000, in an episode that we talk about in the book, uh, the two of them uh, worked and through a sort of a guerrilla action, shut down the illegal logging industry in the Western part of the territory. Um, they're, they're fearless, they're smart, uh, and they're learning how to work both their tribal codes of conduct and the legal system uh, of Brazil to protect their territory. Uh, the, uh, in the last year, uh, they, along with the, the other four tribes, have set up an indigenous uh, patrol uh, team that's going out in the, all, the river, uh, all the river valleys of this huge area called the uh, Javari Valley Indigenous Territory, um, and starting to address the problem of the incursions of poachers, uh, gold miners, uh, and loggers. Um, and Thomas Einfa sent me a, a video uh, on Friday on WhatsApp that I just wanted to share with you because it made me smile so much. Uh, and it's just an example of people, smart people who are completely all in dedicated uh, getting results. So they, their team, the indigenous patrol team uh, alerted the authorities last Thursday that uh, there was somebody coming out of the territory with a bunch of uh, illegally caught fish uh, and um, live turtles, uh, which are sold in urban markets. Um, he was arrested, uh, everything confiscated, and the, um, uh, and the turtles uh, sent home. So I, I neglected to turn on the, um, the sound here, so I'm afraid that you're only going to see the uh, the video, but it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. So he's just saying this is a big, beautiful turtle, and uh, going back to going home. Yeah, apologies again, I forgot to turn on audio when I started the presentation, but um, we're gonna finish up with this slide. So um, uh, this is three weeks ago in central Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, a massive environmental protest against the government's policies on the Amazon. And it's just, um, Brazil gets in the, uh, in the news for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and I just wanted to show this to finish our, our show here because my conviction is that people basically love nature uh, and there's something programmed into us uh, that uh, we, we want to do the right thing. Um, and we wanna live on a planet that still has nature. Uh, and it's been a huge, um, boon to my life to work in Brazil over the last 30 years uh, and know the extraordinary people and their commitment uh, to protecting their country, their Amazon and our, our planet. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna end there and I'll just, before we get into Q and A, um, want to summarize, I guess, uh, where Tom Lovejoy and I came out on the things that policymakers need to do to protect our megaforests. And there are really three things 
there, there are lots of things. Uh, there are many, many things that are, are important and positive that can be done. Um, if we got um, three minutes of time with uh, all the people making all the decisions that are going to make the difference, we would talk about three things. One is recognizing and upholding indigenous land rights and their traditional uh, ways of holding and protecting land. The second is to massively expand protected areas around the world, focusing on big forests and doing it in a, in a way that's socially intelligent and, and that will therefore make it sustainable. The third is to keep roads out of the forest. I've been working on this issue for many years, um, back to the mid nineties uh, and uh, roads have been the vectors of destruction in all uh, big forests throughout the world. And though there have been some instances of roads being closed uh, and the areas restored, uh, once they're there, it's very hard uh, to undo them. So uh, that's it for my presentation and I'm excited and welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Sean. Wow, that was so beautiful. And I just wanna mention for the folks at home that um, you took, you were the photographer for a lot of those images as well, right? So um, you both have an English degree, which um, may speak to the quality of the writing in the book, um, public policy masters, and maybe a photography degree too, maybe, that's not in your bio, no. Application. <laughs> beautiful. Um, well, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. And we have some great questions coming in through the Q&A. Just a reminder to our attendees that um, if you have a question, we you can pop that into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, and why don't we just, we can just dive right in. There's some great questions coming in here. Um, question from Jane, do farming cycles in New Guinea destroy old growth or are those areas respected or spared as growing areas move around? I think this was asked as you were um, talking about some of those, those farming practices that, that shift and move. Jane, thanks for the question. It's interesting. It's an interesting one because our notion of old growth. I, I grew up in the redwood region, um, and our notion of old growth is that there are two kinds of redwoods. There's really big ones that are old growth, and there's everything else. And there's only five percent left of the original old growth uh, in the, the the region where redwoods grow. It's different in a place like New Guinea. Um, first of all, while the trees get big and, and old. Um, it's not the same as in, in California. The natural cycles are, are not as long. But also, um, the concept of um, old growth, it supposes that at some point, people go through and decimate a whole bunch of forest and leave some. Uh, and that that stuff is, that is left is 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 sacred uh, because it's what what's left. The methods that are used by the people uh, in New Guinea traditionally move around the forest so and, and don't cut the whole thing down, um, but cut down small areas. And also, uh, incidentally, the folks that I showed in the Amazon they do the same thing. Uh, so they'll farm farm a particular area they'll leave it for many, many years, uh, and they may never return there, um, but they may return there in 100 years uh, or 200 years. Uh, and it's funny that, that you bring this up because um, a big focus of my work in the last several years has been on protection of uncontacted tribes. And they do the same thing. Um, they cut down a small area of forest. Uh, they, most of them, not all, are agriculturalists. Um, and then they move on. Um, and, and the moving on, it's interesting. It's not just a function of needing uh, new ground to farm. It's a function of game as well. So if people are in a particular area living too intensively for a long time, um, the game becomes scarce. So interesting. Yeah, I feel like we when we think of just you know, you take out part of the forest and that's it. Like it, it's done and we're gonna use it for what we need now versus more of a, I guess a collaborative or more healthful um, 
interrelationship there with using the force without totally destroying, just like taking a bite out of it and using it, but you're going to maybe restore it back. Right. Well, when you're um, six days boat ride from the store, um, you <laughs> think twice about doing something that's going to comprise, uh, compromise the system that's, um, that's feeding you. Uh, and I think that's, um, uh, uh, that's a big difference. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. There's a little more at stake there when it's right next to you. Um, there are a question about the forests in Canada um, from Jane again. Is there a goal to join up those protected areas? Uh, that's a great question. Yes, um, there, there is a goal to do that. And there are several, um, not just the indigenous areas, but uh, the more traditional protected areas as well. And that's part of the planning that goes into them is how to create space at large scales for things like caribou migration, for example, uh, mm -hmm. where even large traditional national parks have not been big enough. Right, yeah, you, um, the mega forest, I'm just turning to a, a little pull out quote here about, you know, the size of a mega forest. Um, which is, I believe the definition here, 500 square kilometers um, that are free of roads, power lines, mines, cities, and industrial farms. Um, is that right? So yeah, I'll clarify on that. Thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh, different scientists have struggled with uh, how do we define this thing? What is a big forest? And of course, ecologically, it matters what kind of ecosystem you're in. But uh, we talk about how the first definition of intact forests came about. Uh, and it was the, the number that you're, that you're citing. It's 500 square kilometers, uh, which is about 125,000 acres. Um, if you want to imagine it in, in terms of things you might be able to picture, it's about four San Francisco's uh, or 50,000 soccer fields. And this was a sort of a pragmatic choice where it's not so big as to eliminate all of the candidates, but it's big enough that most ecological processes uh, can take place in that setting. So what we call a mega forest is actually a collection of those things. And then the surrounding forest that is somewhat more intensively used has been impacted, um, but is still a functioning buffer uh, mm. around the most intact cores. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, it's really surprising to hear things like the how big of an impact the roads would have, um, I guess, partially because of the spill off from that road and that activity that's happening. Um, it just kind of made me wonder, like, wow, with our national parks and things like so convenient to cruise in on the road and camp and, you know, hike and everything. And I hadn't really thought about the impact of that convenience. So um, it's definitely something um, that just kind of makes you think twice, I guess. Um, let's go back to some audience questions. Um, folks, really great questions coming in. Thank you so much. Um, we have an anonymous question here. You described several different strategies involving or depending on the indigenous population. Are these strategies being recognized across different regions or and or informing possible new strategies in additional regions? Mm, that's a great question. So our chapter on indigenous guardianship it, we, we sort of pan across the, all these the different forests and the different countries within the forests because the different countries with the Amazon, for example, have wildly different public policies around the acknowledgement of indigenous land rights. And it really varies quite a bit. So I would put at the top of the heap, I would put Brazil, uh, Colombia, and Canada uh, in acknowledging the, the, the rights and the stewardship of indigenous peoples uh, on their, their forests. And my criteria for saying that um, are that the recognition is not just of areas around small villages. Um, many times villages were a creation of missionaries and governments who wanted to concentrate people uh, to control them, to educate them, to evangelize them. Um, and then Subsequently, land rights are being defined as just a little perimeter around those villages where people farm. The countries who have got it right are recognizing the full ancestral territories. 
Uh, and these are important places where people have sacred sites, where they hunt, where they fish, where they travel through, et cetera. The, the second really important thing here is that they're inalienable rights. Um, the, the death knell for indigenous land uh, rights is often when the areas are titled and made transferable uh, uh, because the places get sold. Uh, so in the constitutions of Brazil and Colombia, for example, the land rights are very strong, but they're inalienable. You can't sell it. Um, if you go to the Congo, it's a much more difficult situation uh, where the, the rights, there's recent legislation about the rights of uh, the, uh, the pygmy tribes, uh, but they're not really having too much effect. Um, and Russia, um, Russia is complicated as well. Uh, there are uh, many and large indigenous minorities in the Russian Far East, in Siberia, and they have endured a uh, colonial process going back to the 1600s. That's not so different from what happened in the American West. Uh, and every time uh, they begin to have a resurgence of acknowledgement of, of their rights, um, the colonizing society invents a new way to, to uh, put those down. So not time to go across the whole world and get into, into a lot of detail, more than to just say it varies quite a bit, which means there are great models out there um, that can be adopted um, and absorbed by, by different countries. Um, but before, <laughs> sorry, one more thing I got to say on this question. New Guinea uh, is remarkable in that despite the colonial process involving Germans, English, Dutch, and Australians, 90% of the land in New, Guinea, in New Guinea is owned in traditional systems by the native people. Um, so on the, 90%? Yeah, 90%. And ownership is this incredible, dynamic, shiftable, adaptable thing that takes account for the changes people need to make uh, mm -hmm. over time. Wow. That's like so, such an amazing concept, isn't it, <laughs> here in the US? Um, yeah, I was really curious about how you ended up, how you went about kind of connecting with and establishing relationships and trust with indigenous folks. Was that, did you have contacts or was it just that you continue to show up or how did you kind of build those relationships? Uh, yeah, it's just having contacts. Um, and some of the folks I am in contact with through my work, um, mm -hmm. But others, it was it was just trusted friends of trusted friends um, who would say, "Okay, here's um, this book these guys are working on, and somebody's gonna was, would like to come visit you." Uh, and so uh, that's pretty much how it worked. Gotcha. Um, th there's been a question um, here in the Q and A about ways to support these indigenous efforts from afar. Do you have ideas about that? I mean, I guess um, potentially through the Neotero or the Conservation Strategy Fund. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of great organizations and pretty soon um, I'm gonna get around to listing the organizations that were particularly helpful uh, in helping us learn and, and put together the material for the book. Um, and I would say too, though, since we're all well, I don't know um, who's on the uh, on the seminar, the webinar here, but those of us who are in the United States, there are um, interesting, if sort of uh, very incipient or or nascent efforts to bring uh, Native Americans back into a, a larger role uh, on our public lands, mm -hmm. uh, and as you. Some of you may know uh, indigenous people were, were instrumental in the Bears Ears controversy uh, in Utah and getting that land restored uh, to national monument status. Uh, people that I work with in, the, uh, in Montana, the Blackfeet, uh, the Blackfeet uh, over a course of a couple of decades defeated um, plans to drill for natural gas and the adjacent uh, national forest land, uh, which is part of their traditional territory, but not part of their reservation. And I think there's a huge opportunity for that in Alaska. 
uh, where you have a patchwork of, of native and, um, and BLM forest service uh, and other land uh, state lands uh, for our indigenous peoples to be playing a, a role. So that's really at the level of um, tell your member of Congress what you think, uh, but also you can be active in um, at last, uh, what day was it? This last weekend, some friends invited us up to protest logging in the Jackson State Forest in Mendocino County, uh, where my family and I used to live. And um, I, I was not anticipating this, but it was uh, an indigenous protest. It was led by the Coyote Valley Pomo, and they brought in tribes from all over the state uh, to protest an anachronistic logging program uh, in the uh, Jackson State Forest, which are getting back to the redwoods for the, from Jane, uh, it's it's uh, the biggest state forest we have, and some of the the, the only second growth uh, big redwoods uh, that there are. So, to wow. summarize, I'd say there's a multiplicity of different ways you could do it, um, and uh, just doing something is is what's important. Mm. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, there's uh, some more questions about um, indi uh, working with indigenous folks. Joanna is asking, there are many challenges of co-management with shared agreements between indigenous communities and nations and settler governments. Could you give some more examples or go further in depth about how and where power sharing is going well? Perhaps the indigenous First Nations areas and now called Canada. And I think you did kind of touch on this a little bit in that previous question about where it's being effectively, um, or where it's kind of being taken seriously, I guess you could say. Are there any further thoughts you'd want to add on that? Yeah, outside of Canada, there are a couple of examples that we talk about in the book that are really interesting. Uh, one is in Colombia. Uh, there's a place called the Yagohe Apaporis um, National Park, which is also uh, on top of the indigenous lands of six or seven different uh, peoples. And it, it was put there at the instigation of the tribes. Uh, so often the, some wide-eyed conservationists come in and they say, oh, let's make a national park here uh, without really seeing that the land is land that has been occupied by, by, by humans for a very long time. What happened in this case is that mining companies were coming in with wide eyes. Uh, and doing what has happened over and over again, uh, it's just, it's so routine uh, as to be depressing, which is they divide the tribes. They come in with money, uh, they come in with some jobs, uh, and they say, here's a, here's a, you know, here's a way for you guys to get, get money. And they create these rifts in communities between people who want to go that path and people who, uh, who don't. And so what the tribes did is they went to the government and we say, we don't even wanna go through that. Uh, we know that it'll happen and we know it'll destroy the integrity of our community. So would you please create a national park uh, on top of this land? The other example I wanna point out to say something good about Russia uh, is that there's a park called the Bikin National Park in Russia uh, and it protects Amur tigers. And it was proposed by the Russian government in uh, the early 2010s uh, it, because Russia and the other countries that are in the range of tigers were part of a big World Bank Smithsonian project to save the tigers. Russia wanted to do its part. So they said, well, let's set up this national park. And it happened to be the traditional land of the Udege people. Uh, and the last intact, unroaded water, watershed in the Russian Far East. And the Udige refused. They said, what do you mean you're going to put a park here? And you're going to tell us what to do. You're going to tell us not to hunt. You're going to take away our livelihoods um, and have these bureaucrats running our lives. Um, so they were good at, uh, enough at negotiating that they... Um, eventually approved the park, but according to a number of conditions that make it an outlier and a real success um, throughout the taiga, uh, where there's a requirement that an Udige person be either the director or the co-director, that their um, livelihood activities be um, incurred, well permitted, um, and that uh, the Udige people themselves be employed as the, the rangers and guides in the park. 
So I'd say those are the things that came that that jumped to mind with that question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, gosh, we are closing in on the end here. And I know there's another uh, small section that you're going to read and so many good questions here. So sorry, folks, that we're not going to be able to reach all of your wonderful questions. Um, but maybe this would be a good one if you have any advice for Ursula who asks, um, do you have any advice for someone going into conservation regarding education, policy making, levels of importance, et cetera? I'm in my first year of college and I'm trying to learn as much as I can in every direction. Uh, her main focus, by the way, is ocean conservation. Mm. I would say to Ursula that it would be a good idea to ex expose yourself to uh, a, a few different disciplines. Um, you may try some science, try some economics, uh, try uh, something related to law, and sort of figure out what floats your boat. Um, all, all of these things are needed. Uh, and the more you can find something that um, matches your skills and makes you happy to be doing it uh, on a daily basis. Um, and then talk to people who are 10 or 20 or 40 years into their careers uh, to see what their paths were and um, if they have uh, ideas for, for how you should, you should proceed. Sounds like great advice to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, we also have a question about, um, if we can get to a couple more quickly here. Yeah, yeah, um, go from, for it. Okay, great. From um, Aja here, amazing presentation. Thanks, John. What are your thoughts on forest carbon credits as another mechanism to protect these intact forests and to support indigenous livelihoods? There's no short answer for that. <laughs> and, Next, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, I will say briefly that we have a chapter on this in the book. There was a lot of enthusiasm for the idea of carbon credits because the idea was, well, if we just pay people to take care of the forest, um, that'll solve the problem. What um, the, however, uh, there's so much, the devil's in the details, let me put it that way. And um, the, the costs of setting up a system where you have a reliable market where people know what they're getting and know what they have to do, and also where they can prove that if the carbon deal hadn't happened, the forest would have been lost. Um, the, the costs of doing all that. Um, make other solutions more attractive. Uh, in economics, we call that the transaction costs. So the transaction costs get very high. But what we have seen um, some success from are deals that are a little bit less precise and specific. Uh, so Norway had a deal with Brazil in the early 2000s to reduce deforestation. And Norway said, here's a billion dollars um, tell us what you're going to do to, to reduce deforestation. And Brazilian institutions such as universities, conservation organizations, indigenous tribes, state governments, all got in on this um, and did a whole series of actions that were backed up by federal policy, and they reduced their deforestation by 80%. Now, Norway did not get any carbon credits out of it. So that's the, the stage where it gets trickier where the buyer, so to speak, wants to get something that they can hold and they can sell on as a commodity. But mm -hmm. as I said, that's a, it's a longer conversation. Um, and uh, the questioner um, is free to follow up with me uh, for uh, more discussion. Awesome. Um, and I believe maybe I'll pop your website in the chat because there's a, a way to contact you there. Um, and a lot more, actually, I'll add a lot more great information um, on the website. So definitely recommend checking that out. Um, okay, I'm gonna just do one more question here because I can't help it. Um, question about the, young, the youths. Um, Heather asks, my young children, seven and 10 years old, are very worried by what they learn about the current trajectory of planet Earth and the loss of wildlife habitat. Um, what can we as a family do to help and how do I help them find hope? I'm so glad you asked that question. What's the name of the questioner? Heather. Heather, thanks for the question. Um, everybody can do something to help. And that's because our carbon emissions destroy forests. Uh, and the resources that we use uh, also destroy forests, whether it's 
copper and lumber and cement to build your house, um, or it's the oil and gas that you use to heat your house or make your car go, uh, or to fly uh, across the country to see grandma. Um, we, you know, none of us can be uh, perfect climate saints, uh, but I, I'll speak for myself. I know that there's more that I could do. Um, and everything that any of us does um, to reduce our carbon emissions it has both a direct and an indirect effect on megaforests. Um, and the, the world is an interlinked system. Megaforests are part of it. Uh, and so the things that you do at home, uh, even though they might seem small, voting seems small too, but if a lot of people do it, um, it can make a difference. Thank you. We can all remember that when everything seems like, honestly, what is the point, you know? Um, so thank you for that reassurance. Um, well, I really appreciate all the questions everyone has asked in the Q&A, and I wish we had time for all of them, but uh, it is time to wrap up, and I would love it if you could close us out with um, one last reading from the book. Okay, so I started with the beginning of the beginning of the book, and I'm going to end with the beginning of the end of the book. Um, this is um, chapter 12. Uh, Thomas Seinpa trapped in a Zoom square like many of us in mid-2020, reflected on humanity's choice. I was reading Genesis to my dad one time, translating the Bible into Marubo. I was reading about paradise where Eve ate something, whatever it was, uh, and got us in trouble. And my father said, that's it. That's the place Kanavuan gave us. Thomas Sainpa paused for a moment. Kanavuan is the Marubo's supreme spiritual being. I'm telling you, there are places where paradise still exists. Sitting next to a creek, hearing all the birds, that's my paradise. I'm not sure how to put it into words, but this is what I want to explain to you. Paradise in Marubo is Yoyavumai. It means a sacred place of peace, stillness, and connection. He continued, people need to understand that the earth, we are on it. There are physical issues at play. If we go back to the way we were before the pandemic, the end of the world is here. It all depends on us. You get it? We can create heaven or hell here. The forest is part of that decision. Heaven or hell? It's the last of what Kanavalan gave us. Thank you, Coral, and thanks everybody for listening. You're on mute.